He says, be blessed. So Lord, I pray in this place that we would be ready even this week, oh God, that we're going to be ready to step into that new place. People are already going to start to see the results of being fully committed to you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's sing that song and then we're going to close. Praise the Lord. God bless you. We're going to sing this last song. Are you ready? Are you ready to be blessed? Are you ready to be blessed? I have decided to follow Jesus. forgive me, I trust in your forgiveness, I repent, I don't want to do it again, and then connect with him again and walk forward, and then for the rest of it man, just step into your gift, step into your place, start to shine, start to glow, take the limits off, take the cap off, take the lid off, take the covering off and just glow, just shine, just love, just be, be amazing, Right. Be bold. Be loving. Be giving. Be courageous. Be innovative. Speak the truth. Love. Sing. Pray. Teach. Reach. Preach. It's time to step it up a level. It's time to go another another step. It's time to get back into that place. It's time to get the cutting edge back. It's time that it gets raised up again. It's time that that spirit that came into you when you first got born again rises up again with resurrection power. Changes the way you live. Changes the way you see. You ain't a victim. You're a victor. You don't have to be overcome, but you can be an overcomer. God is going to raise you up. He's going to give you your heart's desires as you delight in Him. You're going to see new things take place. Great things take place. single individual one of you God is calling you he loves you he wants you forget all the things you've heard about church forget all the things you've heard about religion look at Christ he's perfect he never fails he never puts a foot wrong he's provided a perfect sacrifice for us that we can live in him he's given us a plan there are things that he's got in front of us that we should walk in those things and those places. You know the mad thing is, and I'm going to close with this. The mad thing is that when God asks you to let go of that place that you're in, sometimes the place that we got away from but got back into, you know, you get Christians that, that get all weird about Christianity. I've got to give up everything, become a monk, live in a cave, shave my head. You know, not do this. They get all weird about it. Then you've got others that just compromise with it. Well, I can do this and I can do that. And God's not, you know, no thunderbolts hit me. I haven't got leprosy or anything. I can get away with that. And you've got two extremes. Right? God don't want extremes. He wants you to just get in the stream you know the mad thing is that what when I, when, from, from personal thing if 
from my personal life. When I got saved and I was, I, to, I, I knew I'd give stuff up because it was bad for me. Right? It was bad for me. Drugs and drink and sex and all that madness. It was bad for me. It was not doing me any good. So I gave it up. Went into Christ. Got saved. You know, never smoked another cigarette. Took another narcotic. Never done any of that stuff since. Didn't sleep with my wife before we got married. All of that stuff. But you know the mad thing is, what, what I gave up for Christ that people are so afraid of. Well, if I give this up, what life have I got left? He's given me back more. Some of it he gave me back. I can go out, I can have a good time. You know what I mean? I can get down. Right? But I'm not going to be jumping up and down in some mad place with loads of drunk and demon weird, demon weirded people around me thinking that that's okay. But he gives you back something that's better. I don't need to get high. Because I've got the most high. Are you with me? I don't need to run around after this relationship or that relationship because I've got the best relationships in the world. My God, my wife, my kids, my church. Amazing. What do you need anything else for? And then you can still enjoy nice things. You can have a nice house, you can have a good job, you can go on nice holidays, have nice cars. Own them, just don't let them own you. It's cool. He gives it back to the church. I've been at that moment. What do you want to do, son? Do you want to just, you know, settle down? You've done all right. Do you want to just settle down, be cool, live, live nice? Or do you want to go for it again? Do you want to go to the next, the, the next level? Do you want to go to the next rung? Do you want to step out again? And I tell you right now, I've said, I want to go for it, Lord. I want to go for it. What about you? What about you? I'm going to open up these altars as the worship team sing. And I believe that a spirit of revival is about to hit this church. Spirit of revival, spirit of refreshing is about to hit your life. But you've got to step out of where you're at. You've got to trust God, man. Trust God. Greatness. That your life will make a difference.
I pray for you right now. Come on, let's pray right now. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that every single person in this place would know that in you, Jesus, there is greatness available. There is a great life to live. Lord, that we would step into that now, that we would decide to go where you go, to do what you say, to believe what you've told us, to connect with you, oh God, and just follow you in this journey. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would, Lord God, rise up within your people. Rise up beyond all of the limitations and rise up beyond all of the the shutters and the doors that we place in our lives, the, the safety valves. Rise up within us, O oh God, and blow those valves. Lord, that we would know that if you send us, there is a reason and you go with us. That if you've said it, it will come to pass. That if you've called us, it was for a purpose. That if you've loved us, it is without end. This isn't about you loving us. This is this is a loving loving us less. This is about you loving us in the way that you saved us for. That we would enter into your love in its fullness. Don't let your fear hold you back. Don't let sin hold you back. Don't think that you've got to thrash yourself, beat yourself and do all that stuff. you just got to turn to God if you've messed up and turn to God and say, Jesus. What you have to understand is this. That when God gives you an opportunity to choose to do great things in His name, by His strength, in His grace, for His power, for His glory, you're going to get blessed in it. Look at Abraham. He was tripping over goats and sheep. Right? Lot tried to do it himself, kept trying to do it himself, kept trying to hide, kept trying to be insignificant, kept trying to get out of the way. Maybe he got hurt, maybe he didn't agree with something, maybe something happened, whatever. But the fact is that he couldn't even handle insignificance. And then he tried to do the big thing himself and ended up reaping consequences that went on and on and on and on and on for hundreds of years and many generations. So what the Lord wants, I believe, for us to do in this place today is just make a decision. Do we want greatness? Or do we want insignificance? Do you want to live according to your means? To take your inheritance? Or do you want to live beneath your means? I know what I want. I know what I've chosen. What about you? Father, in this place today, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move upon our hearts. Oh God, that you would speak to our hearts, that you have spoken to our hearts. That we would trust you, oh God, for the great things that you have. We don't even know what they are. And that's the, po that's the problem for many people. Well, many people still have a misconceived idea that we're talking about being a slave to the church or being a fanatical lunatic or looking stupid and being weird. But that's, I pray God, you get that out of people's minds. This is about our connection with you, our life with you. This is about creational stuff, eternal stuff. This is about us shining as lights for you in the midst of a dark and perverse generation. This is about us becoming everything you've created us to become. Help us, oh God, to make those choices. Everyone stand. I want to give you a couple of minutes as the worship team sing, just to begin to mold this over. And I am going to make an altar call. Listen to me. Faith is not something you conjure up yourself, work up yourself. Faith is a response to God's grace. It's our response. He, 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 we have the response. There is a responsibility that we step into God's grace at moments. And that's faith. You trust in that. He is who He says He is. He's, he can do what He says He's going to do. He's revealed it to us. 
and that if we trust Him, God's pleased with that. We can't always see the way forward. We, we have things that bother us. We have things that, that are around us. This is not an altar call for people to come and sign up to the departments in the church. It's not about coming and giving all your money. It's not about doing all of this and all of that. It's not about that. This is between you and God and your destiny in Him. Do you want to go to the mountain and live a life that is great? Do you want to live a great life? Or are you happy with just living an insignificant one and just getting by? Because it's your decision, not mine. God's not going to make it for you. It's yours. And this is an altar call for you to connect with Him and just say, God, I really want to do your will. I'm going to follow you where you lead. I'm going to trust you. And then there's so much, man. There's so much. There's freedom. There's forgiveness. Forgiveness. Oh, there's going to be discipline, but there's no punishment in Christ. There's discipline, but there's no punishment. Christ took the punishment. But there's power. And it's not weird power. It's not funky power. It's not, I'm going to blow you over power. It's I'm going to be able to live free. It's like, I'm going to be able to shine as a light. It's I'm going to be able to serve God in a way that's going to make a difference in the world around me, power. It's that I'm going to be alive, truly alive, power. And it sometimes takes us years to get to this point. But there come moments in our lives when God is saying, I've got another place for you. Let go of that. Jump onto this. And I believe with all my heart that we're in that moment right now as a church and as a people. I know I've been. And if I've been in a moment, normally as a pastor of the church, normally it kind of bleeds down into the chair watching people run around kicking a ball. In God's zone, you're on the pitch kicking the ball. That's the difference. Are you with me? Check it out. He hesitated. Why? Is it fear? Sometimes it's fear. We fear success or failure. Are you with me? We don't want to fail because we, we don't want to be shown up as failures. Or we don't want to succeed because we know that if we succeed, more is going to be given to us. We don't want a responsibility. So even though you're really talented, you're really gifted, and God wants you to do stuff, you don't want to do it because you know, because you look at other people that are doing it and think, God, they're working hard. I don't really want that. <laughs> but listen, it's not about you, is it? Because at the end of the day, when you get judged, what are you going to say? Well, I couldn't really be bothered. <laughs> you know what I mean? I knew it was very difficult. I knew you were a hard master, reaping where you did not sow and all that. You know what I mean? God's going to look at you and go, you wicked, lazy servant. Whatever you had, take it off him. Give it to the one that was doing it. That's the parable. You ain't getting away with it. But why should we? We should just step into it and go for it. Maybe it's fear. Or maybe you've just swallowed Satan's lie that your position equals your performance plus other people's opinions of you. And you think, well, I can't do it. No, you can't do it. If you could do it, you would be God. You wouldn't need Jesus, but you're not. So you need him. You need his grace. You need his power. You need his anointing. But God said, go to the mountains. But you know what Lot chose? Mountains speak of greatness. You know, you can go through all the scriptures that speak of greatness. They represent great things, great revelation. They speak about vision. They speak about tremendous, powerful things that take place. But Lot said, no, I don't want to go to the mountains unless I get destroyed. Because he was still thinking about himself. He was still doing it himself. He was still trying to work it out himself. He was still looking at himself. He said, I don't want to go there. Send me over there instead to Zoar. Yeah, I don't want to be here getting judged, but I don't want to be up there getting judged. Tell me if you know, you're going to get judged. Right? It's horrible. When you're not doing anything right, you're getting judged. When you're doing things right, you're getting judged. When you're living for God, everyone's judging you, right? When you're not living for God, everyone's judging you. I'd rather be judged for doing good than judged for doing bad. Huh? He said, let me go to the, the, the small place, the little place, the insignificant place. So the angel said, cool, go there. But then here's the thing. 
This is where it gets mad, right? Lot chose Zoar, the place of insignificance, because he dreaded personal sacrifice, it seems. He shrunk from self-denial. He, he couldn't find it in himself to do battle with the things that were holding him back. So he went to the place of insignificance. We see it a lot. We've all been there. So God's messenger let him go there. His wife's already turned into a pillar of salt. She couldn't handle coming out. She looked back. She turned into a pillar of salt. Son-in-laws are mangled. They're, they're, they're burned up in the fire. It's just Lot and his daughters. Right? Lot and two daughters go to Zoar. But then when he's in Zoar for a little bit, in the place of insignificance, it weren't enough. They got afraid of being there. The Bible says that they got afraid of living in insignificance. They got afraid of being there. They didn't like it. So they tried to go back to the mountain, but under their own steam. So now they're trying to become great by their own power. They're doing it themselves. Right? Instead of just going when God said, they chose something else and then tried to get back to a place of greatness. But look what happens. You read through the scriptures. After this, you see that when they got back to the mountains, right, they weren't in the right frame of mind. Lot's daughters looked around and thought, well, all the city's gone. Our husbands are gone. All we've got left is our old man. We don't know anything that's going to happen. How are we going to continue our line? All that's left is our dad. Everyone else is gone. Our husbands are dead. What are we going to do? We've been in insignificance. It, it hasn't worked. We've come back to the mountains, but now we're trying to do something great for ourselves. So what they did, they got Lot drunk. It probably didn't take a lot. That wasn't a pun. But he got drunk. He must have wanted to get drunk. He got drunk, and then they slept with him. Check that out. Because they wanted to have kids. And they got pregnant. And they had kids. And one was called Moab. And one was called Ben Ami, who became the ancestor of the Ammonites. The Moabites and the Ammonites both became the enemies of the Israelites. They tried to pervert the situation. And Lot tried to stay cool with them and said, no, 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 leave those men, take my daughters instead. This was how far the compromise had gone, the hospitality laws in a city of wickedness, that he was still trying to keep hold of the hospitality laws in a city of wick wickedness and tried to compromise with wickedness. Instead of taking a stand and saying, no, stop it, what's the matter with you? He said, no, 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 don't do it with them because they're my guests, but take my virgin daughters instead. What? How far do you have to go to do that? But it crept on him. Let's move forward real quick. See, the thing is, when God tries to reach into our lives, there's going to be people around us that hate it. And the reason why they hate it is because in their perverse mindset, they want to try and destroy any chance of you getting free, living free and living the way that you're meant to be, because it will highlight the fact that they're not. Has that ever happened to anyone? I remember when I got set free from drugs, I came out of the, the, the Victory Outreach Men's Home completely set free for the first time in 12 years of any drug, any alcohol, any nicotine, anything. People that I knew, that knew me back in the day and saw me now started offering me drugs for nothing. What? Why are you offering me this? Oh, come on, bruv. Don't be so holy. Are you with me? People try and do that. And that's what was trying to happen. We see this all around us in, in, in society. And the thing is, some Christians like Lot will even start to water down God's word and God's will and God's ways to keep in with society. That's what Lot was doing with his daughters. Are you with me? I know this is hard right now, but it gets better. Huh? You know Why? Because they're living insignificant lives. And they don't want your life to look great. Problem is, Lot's credibility was damaged. When he tried to warn his son-in-laws and try to get them to leave their situation, they laughed at him. <laughs> Shut up, what's the matter with you? You're living the same as us. Who are, you, who are you to tell us what to do? Because his credibility was shot. See, it don't matter what incredible things you tell to people if you're not credible with those people. Are you with me? Time was running out. His son-in-laws didn't move. They wouldn't go. They didn't want to do nothing. 
Lot was in trouble. God wanted to fix his problem. And he wants us to understand that he is the fixer of our problems. But look what happened. Back to our original scripture. He hesitated. He hesitated. So the angels seized his hand. And they said, run for your lives. Get out. They intervened. God wants to intervene. He wants us. He loves us so much. He has so much for us. That he doesn't want us to live lives of insignificance. What Jesus did on the cross and rising from the grave was not an insignificant thing. It was to pay the price once and for all for our restitution, reconciliation with God the Creator. That we can live an eternal life in freedom. That's not an insignificant thing. And then from that, he wants us to live in a way that is going to be a blessing to those around us. And they said to him, come on, get out, go to the mountains. This is key. God's love for us is this, that even if you've been compromised and even if you've backslid, even if you've been living safe, God doesn't want to just come and slap you and tell you you're doing wrong. You're not doing good. What's the matter with you? He says, come on guys, get out of there. That's no good for you. But don't just get out, come to the mountains. You've been living down here in this place. You've been living beneath your means. You've been living under the radar. You've been living in the comfort zone. You've been living safe. But I've got something for you. I want you to come to the mountains. I want you to see where it's really at. I want you to start to know me for who I am. I want you to start to shine. I've put things in you. I've created you for a purpose. I've given you stuff to do. And I want you to do it. You don't realise some of you in this place, man. If you just stepped out and just let go of your trapeze and jumped onto the one that God had for you, how far forward you were going to go, how far quickly you're going to accelerate, where it is that you're going to go in opportunity in your life. Man, I've seen it so many times. In this place, we've seen people struggle, 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 and then just do God's will, just bless Him, just step out of their comfort zone, just believe Him for what it is that He has said, and boom, all of a sudden, they're all getting married, they're getting this, they're getting that, they're doing this, their ministry is growing, stuff is taking place in their life. That's an acceleration and a growth. But you don't do that in a comfort zone. Comfort zone, you just sit on a couch. In the comfort zone, you're sitting, on, you're sitting on, a, on, a, on a comfort zone. And I'm not trying to get on you if you go out for a meal or you go out and you dance at a party. We had a wedding the other day, beautiful wedding. They stuck some questionable songs on, I'll tell you, at the end of the party. <laughs> DJ was there. I don't think the DJ was saved. But he was sticking on some every, every, every dub things, talking about kill the police officer and, you know, smoking your spliff and stuck in this up your nose and all the rest of it. And there was all people getting down and, you know what I mean, doing their thing. And it's, you know, it's okay, but I'm not getting on that. What I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, right, what I'm saying is, that consistent shadowing of your life. If you've been brought out of darkness into light, don't go back and live in the shadows. Live in the light. Are you with me? But some people, they, they, they can't let go of what they've got to grab onto what God's got. There was a story of a guy, and someone's used this, where we're, it's like we're on this, you know, a, a trapeze. And you're hanging on a trapeze, the trapeze of life, and you're swinging backwards and forwards. You're going good times and bad times and good times and bad times and good times and bad times. And then God comes along and says, yeah, I've got this for you. It's taking you to another level. It's taking you into a better place. It's forward progress. And you're looking at it, swinging backwards and forwards. And you're fed up with swinging backwards and forwards in your life. You're fed up with the, 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 the inconsistency of it. You're fed up with the, just, just the madness of backwards and forwards, but never getting anywhere. But you don't want to, you, 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 you know that to grab onto that, you've got to let go of this. Huh? And a lot of people, they feel safe hanging on to what they've got, even though all it's doing is taking you backwards and forwards, and backwards and forwards, and backwards and forwards over the same old ground. And God's saying, let go and take the leap. He'll even tell you when. When the timing is right. Are you with me? When it's close enough. But Lot hung on. He hung on. 
Lot was tempted with the same temptation that the rest of us face to compromise in what we think are small concerns or the little grey areas of life. And the danger in, the, in that reasoning is that these small compromises weaken our character. And over time they can lead to major sin. And just as we can grow in character little by little, so we can backslide in the same way. Little by little. Little by little. Little things creep in. And eventually the Bible says that Lot was sitting at the gate in Sodom. That don't mean that he was just parked up at the entrance. That means that he was part of the leadership of the city. He was a decision maker. He was a judge. He was someone in a position of authority in a city that had none. Woo! That's like being the biggest cheese in the darkness. That's like, that's like being, a, being, being, being the top demon in hell. Whatever. Huh? What does it profit a man that he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Are you with me? There he was. And he's probably trying to do the right thing. He's trying to shine a little bit of light. But how many of you know his light was covered? There's no way he was in there preaching the gospel to everyone because everyone was just doing their thing. Are you with me? It's like standing up and preaching the gospel in the middle of a nightclub in Manchester. It's pointless really, isn't it? It's like a pencil with no point. <laughs> Now, I'm not saying that God can't move, but come on. No one's bothered, are they? So there he was. And even though he probably weren't involved in all the ugly things that were happening around him, his environment was not holy, and God's justice was demanding action. And Lot and his whole family could have been destroyed just because of his compromise. But Abraham interceded for him. We know the story. God sent an intervention team to come in, get him out. A couple of angels entered Sodom. And then we see how wicked it was because all of the people wanted to have sex with the angels. Now this goes deeper than this. This is a Genesis 6 thing. This is, you know, different stuff where, you know, there were some funky things going on. You have to understand the backstory, but it was still wicked. Imagine wanting to have sex with an angel. That's weird, man. Huh? It's like the guy once was trying to chat up, chat up a girl. Christian guy was trying to chat up a girl. He said to her, he looked at her, he went, he said, uh, did you get hurt when you fell from heaven? <laughs> and he didn't realise, he just said, basically, you're a demon. <laughs> just called her a demon. <laughs> huh? Did you get hurt when you fell from heaven? <laughs> what? He just called the, just called the girl a demon. <laughs> so here he is. Huh? People of that city, twin having first-hand faith and second-hand faith. There's a difference between following your partner's anointing, your spouse's holiness, come on now, and having a little bit of your own. There's a difference in following the man of faith and power for the hour and knowing that you've got a destiny to fulfill as well. But he followed him. There came a time when they started to be blessed, their flocks and their herds increased to the point where they were starting to, to come into contact with each other and have a little bit of drama. Imagine being so blessed that your blessing is causing your problems. Huh? Imagine having so much money that you don't know where to bank it. Some of you are like, I can't even imagine that. Huh? Imagine being so blessed that you don't know what to do with it. And your blessing is starting to bump into your brother's blessing. And your brother's blessing. And your brother's blessing. Amen. I've seen it take place. When we first started this church, we had one car. One car in the church. In the whole church. Then we had two cars. I think Pastor Deji and Moji got a car. Huh? And then me and Vicky had a little full focus. That was it. And we had to get all of our sound equipment and everything into that little full focus to take it to where it was we were going to be setting up to have church, to unload it, to unpack it, to put it up, and then put it down and then take it back in the car and everyone else would be on the bus. Everyone. There was even a point in time when I was the pastor and I was coming to church on the bus. Now, everyone moans because they can't find a space in the parking lot. There's too many cars. I don't know where to park. I have to walk halfway down the road now. It's because we've been blessed as a church. But he got so blessed that it, they, they, they decided to separate. And Abraham said to him, listen, you choose wherever you want to go. 
Abraham knew God. He knew God was going to bless him because God had said he was going to bless him. And he just trusted in God for his blessing. He didn't manipulate, manoeuvre, coerce. He said to Lot, you choose wherever you want to go and then I'll take the other bit. And they saw the plains and they saw the cities. And Lot chose the cities. He went down there. Abraham said, praise God. He stayed there in the wilderness. Lot went down into the city. Genesis chapter 13, verse 8 through 18 describes this decision. But in 12 and 13 it says, So Abraham settled in the land of Canaan. Canaan was a hotbed of Nephilim. It was, it was the giants lived there. It was evil people, corrupted genetically and morally. That's why God wanted to take his people in there and wipe them out. It was the seat of darkness in the earth at the time. You read all the backstories. Canaan was not a good place. It was not filled with good people. Amen. Lot moved down there, he said he moved his tents to a place near Sodom, settled among the cities of the plains. But the people of this area were extremely wicked and constantly sinned against the Lord. Abraham continued to follow the promise, but, God, but Lot decided to do the DIY thing. Huh? Do it yourself. Forget God, do it yourself. And what was happening was compromise was creeping into Lot's life alongside his friend complacency. How many of you know they're buddies? Compromise and complacency. And the thing is that when these two get together and they start having a little thing, little party in your life, eventually they start sucking the life out of your credibility. Complacency and compromise will suck life out of your credibility. And this is a problem. And uh, all of a sudden, you had a testimony of someone that loved the Lord. You had a testimony of someone that did great things. You prayed, you saw amazing things take place. But you try and witness to someone else and there's no power. Because people are looking at you going, oh yeah, well you talk the talk. But you don't walk the walk. I've seen it in Christianity. I've seen it creep in in Christianity in the West. Where you see Christians that are out clubbing. Right? People say, what's wrong with clubbing? But well, there's nothing wrong with, with going out and doing your thing and partying and all that. Unless you look so much like the world that you're trying to reach that you become irrelevant to the world you're trying to reach. Are you with me? That you're there dancing along to tunes that's talking about kill the police officer and sniff things up your nose and, you know, I want 15 lovers and, you know, you're my baby and, you know what I mean? And other mad lyrics that you can't even, some of the lyrics are, I don't even understand. <laughs> now I've been there and done that. How many of you have been there and done that? But I ain't doing it now. Are you with me? And uh, they just they just run. How many of you know that? How many of you is like that? Huh? Just natural athletes, right? What happened? Backslid, man. What happened? Huh? But. We would do the cross country. We'd have to do it once a year. You'd have this cross country run. They'd force you to do it. Right? In school. You remember that? Who remembers? They would force you to do the cross country run. And everyone hated it. Right? And you'd have some that were the natural athletes and they'd go, go! And boom, they was off. Like racing snakes. <laughs> they were gone. Then you'd have some that would run off and they'd be in the woods having a snout. And... <laughs> right? And then they'd cheat and they'd slip through the woods and they'd come out near the end, you know what I mean? Hello, there were some of you in this place. But I was in neither group. I was just one of them dudes that just got his nut down and just struggled. But I would not give up. I wouldn't give up. I wouldn't cheat. But I knew I weren't going to run off with all, all the best of them. So I would just grip my teeth and I would just get on with it. Because that's how I was trained by my dad. Just keep going. Don't quit. Are you with me? You never lose. You either win or you learn. You never lose. He taught me to fight. He said, son, if you're having a fight, you might not win every fight. He said, just don't lose any. Amen. Just keep going. 
keep fighting, keep grafting. That's all I've done in my Christianity, is keep going, keep grafting, keep putting one foot in front of the other, because I want to reach the tape. But here we see a situation where a man decides to do the other thing. He lives, he wants to live safe. Living saved is embracing the challenge to be the best you can, no matter how hard it gets. But living safe is just taking the easy route, no matter how wrong it looks. People who live saved are led by the Spirit, sometimes into the wild places of faith. Remember when Jesus was baptised, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit led, or, or led him into the wilderness. Do, do you remember that? The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. Wow. We want the Holy Spirit to lead us into the palace. Are you with me? Lead us into the place of chicken skin, goosebumps, funny tree shapes. Huh? Not the wilderness where we had to confront the devil. But the Spirit-filled life does that because the Spirit has a job to do. And it is to confront darkness wherever it is that it it is found so that the light can do away with the darkness. And you have to understand that an abundant life in Christ is living a light-filled life. That wherever you go, the authority of Christ in you makes a difference to every situation around you. But there's the other side, the living safe. Huh? Where you don't want to confront dark forces. You, you don't want to face up to some of those things that have held you back and held you bound. You don't want to face up to some of the, the negativity in your life and some of the things that you've done wrong. You don't want to face up to the truth. And so what you do is you just linger around in the comfort zone. Because in the comfort zone, there's no conflict. You just say nothing and you do nothing. But unfortunately, you then become nothing. All of us who follow Christ after we found our identity as children of God are going to face these very real questions of what we should do, how we should live. And occasions are going to come where we have to make decisions and we have to live them with the consequences of those decisions. And I'm, I'm here to tell you today, man, that God wants us to make a decision because he has something amazing for us. But we have to choose. We have to choose. You can choose to live safe or you can choose to live safe. But you can't play the spiritual okey cokey for long. You know? One foot in and one foot out. Because what if the okey cokey was what it's all about? Amen? We'd be in trouble. So this brings me to the, 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 the man called Lot. He had an interesting backstory. We've already said that he was a righteous man. But unfortunately, we can see that he lived a compromised life. He was Abraham's nephew. He followed him from Ur into, uh, which was a civilized city, beautiful city into the wilderness in obedience to the promise of God because he had a destiny he followed his uncle his uncle was the man of faith he followed him that's good how many of you know there's a difference between and so the angels went into that place and we take it up from verse 16 they said to Lot come on God's going to bring some judgment we want to get you out of the city because God's judgment is going to come upon it but look what happens in verse 16 it said Lot hesitated he hesitated. He said, when Lot still hesitated, or in, a, in a, another translation, he said, while Lot lingered, he lingered in that place. He said, the angel seized his hand, the hands of his wife and two daughters, rushed them to safety outside the city, for the Lord was merciful. When they were safely out of the city, one of the angels ordered, run for your lives. And don't look back or stop anywhere in the valley, escape to the mountains. This is important, right? Escape to the mountains, or you will be swept away. And then Lot went, oh no, my Lord, Lot begged. You've been so gracious to me and saved my life, and you have shown such great kindness, but I cannot go to the mountains. Disaster would catch up to me there, and I would soon die. See, there is a small village nearby. Please let me go there instead. Don't you see how small it is? Then my life will be saved. 
All right, the angel said, I'll grant your request. I will not destroy the little village, but hurry, escape to it, for I can do nothing until you arrive there. And this explains why the village was known as Zoar, which means little place. Or, in another literal translation, it means insignificant. So you can see that there's something playing out here. Maybe you can see where I'm going with this, and what the Lord wants us to see. But let me begin by asking you a question. How much of God do you want? How much of his abundance do you want? A lot or a little? Since I became a follower of Christ 23 years ago, I've seen the struggle that people face in church between living safe or living saved. What I mean by that is that salvation is like the starting gun of a race. When you come to Jesus, however you come to Jesus, you have to come to Jesus to get to God the Father, to get to the creator of all things. It's not all roads lead to God, but all roads lead to Jesus. There is one door, it is a narrow door, it is a narrow path, there is no other way in to eternal life and forgiveness and salvation except through Jesus. You can be a Hindu, you can be a Muslim, you can be an atheist, you can be a Jedi. You know they had a census and some people say, what religion are you? And some people put Jedi. My question to them was, were they forced into it? Salvation is like the starting gun of a race. And then some will embrace the challenge to run like champions until they pass the finish line. They will give it their all. They will put all their effort into it and they will run and keep on running. But others, the gun goes off, bang, they start the race and then they'll stop for a bit. They'll get off the track. They'll set up a little picnic. Maybe they'll go back to the starting gun and have a look. Huh? I mean, you know, there's people that do some funky things. Imagine watching the Olympics and Usain Bolt is off. Doof, the lightning bolt. And then 50 yards in, he decides to just sit down for a minute. Then he wouldn't be a multiple Olympic champion. Huh? Because to actually, you've got to actually finish the race. How many of you have ever started a marathon? I started a marathon about 10 years ago. I think I've, I've run enough to qualify by now, but, but just dying a marathon's no good. You've got to finish the marathon to get the medal and get the achievement. Are you with me? And there's a lot of people in Christianity that they start off living saved and end up just somewhere wanting to live safe. Get away from this, get away from that, get out of that situation, get away from that situation. And now they just want to live safe. Huh? They, they take the easy route of minimal effort and they hang back, they coast and they eventually stop. I remember at school, I've never been much of a runner. I'm not really built for it. You know, runners uh, come in all, all different shapes and sizes, except mine, it seems. <laughs> Amen. I said to someone once, well, I'm in shape. He said, yeah, round is a shape. <laughs> but I remember at school, right, I had to work hard at school. I was never that naturally athletic you know like kids that are just born looking like olympic athletes you know what i mean they're like six they've got a six pack and all that big shoulder and so i believe that we have decisions to make i i, I really believe that this church victory average manchester is in a new season we're beginning a new season i really believe it and uh, i believe that god wants his church in the west in the uk to know that he is waiting to pour out His Spirit in a way that we haven't seen for a long time. Not in extravagant weirdness, but with conviction and holiness that people that do not know Him would have their eyes open, their hearts quickened, their sins revealed to them so that they would know that they need salvation and they, they would find out that there is only one way that we can be saved and that is through Jesus Christ. So are you ready today to make a decision, to make a choice? Amen. And we're going to look at what that is. Please take your seats. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 19. When I was looking at all of this, 
And the Lord was showing me, son, you're living beneath your means. You're living beneath your means. There is more for you that you're not tapping into, you're not believing for, you're not positioning yourself for. And I started to question it. I started to look into it. What does that mean? You know, why is that? And I was taken to this portion of scripture in Genesis chapter 19. We're going to read from verse 16. I'm just going to take you on from verse 16. Um, and it's about a man called Lot. So, you know, for those of you that like title in your messages, this message is entitled, How Much Do You Want? A Lot or a Little? Huh? Because you know when you've got a, a name like Lot, you've got to stick that in there somewhere. Praise the Lord. But this is about a man called Lot. Lot was a righteous man. Lot was the nephew of Abraham, the father of faith. Lot was a blessed man. Lot was a God-fearing man. He was a believer. He obviously was someone that was looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, the coming forward, the, 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 the coming forth of God's way of salvation, of getting humanity back to that place where they were with God in the garden, in paradise, that had been lost through Adam's sin. Lot was a righteous man. So let's get that right, right from the off. Okay, This is talking about believers right now. And we go on in, in, in verse uh, 16 of Genesis 19. And it's about Lot in the city of Sodom. Lot is in Sodom. And... Uh, the judgment of God is going to come upon Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah, they were cities of the plain in Canaan. And many commentators, if you read around this story, you see that, that there was a lot of madness that was going on in these cities. There was fornication, there was, you know, uh, uh, violence. People had sacrificed their children to the different gods. You know, there was, there was lots of different madness that was going on in this place. But Lot was living there with his family. But the judgment of God was going to come upon it because the outcry of the city and of the victims and of the people reached up to God and God decided he was going to take care of this, this problem. And he was going to wipe it out. Abraham interceded with God. We see, when you read, read the scripture, you see that some angels and the angel of the Lord came to, to Abraham and they sat with him and he started to converse with the Lord and he, he, he interceded. He said, what if there's, you know, a hundred or fifty righteous people in there? Would you spare it? And the Lord said, yeah. But they weren't. What if there's ten? He said, yeah. There wasn't even ten. He said, you know, but, but, but lots in there. So the Lord said, I'm going to get him out, basically. That's my paraphrase. Just keep getting you up to speed, all right? So the angels went in to Sodom to get Lot and his family out because judgment was going to come. Now, how many of you know that sometimes it seems that people in the world that are wicked, they seem to get away with a lot, right? And sometimes even Christians can, you know, can fall into sinful ways and think that they're getting away with it. But just because you're getting away with it for a little while, don't mean to say you're going to get away with it forever, right? Because I've, I've lived in the world, I've done all the madness, I used to see people, you know, that were wicked, earning lots of money, getting away with stuff. And it was like, wow, how did they get away with it? But now they're lifed off, dead, you know, mangled, messed up, addicted. You know, their families are messed up, their kids are addicted. It never, ever, ever goes that way forever.
Father, I just want to thank you for today. I thank you that you are a great God. Lord, I pray that today in this place, people that are watching online from all over the world, Lord, would understand what it is that you are saying to us today. There's decisions to make. That we should believe in your greatness and follow that path. Or we should seek another route that will take us somewhere else. Holy Spirit, today I pray, help me to get across this message. And may it sink down deep into everyone's spirit. So that we can start living according to our means and not below our means. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Before you see it, just stay where you're at. I don't often do this, but I'm going to prophesy. Because I believe that God has shown me something that is very, very important. For us in this church, but for the church in a Western society, especially in the UK, I believe that God is, has been showing me that we've been living beneath our means. What that, what that basically means is to me is that God is great, God is powerful, God is good, God can do incredible things. And that we as his people need to be making decisions to do things according to him, his will and his word. And not based upon our own thoughts, our own thinking, our own feelings about ourselves or the world around us. God, I believe, wants us to know that it's time to make a decision to step up. Not to live beyond our means with extravagant claims of weirdness and madness and you know, uh, crazy riches and, you know, just, just stuff that is beyond our means. Not extravagant, ridiculous Christian stuff. But not below our means, not beneath our means. And I read a story about a man who was in New York. He was in New York. I've read a couple like this. And the story said that he had died frozen to death homeless underneath a railway bridge not knowing that he was the heir to a multi-million dollar fortune he was due 30 million dollars and people were searching for him to try and tell him that he'd become a multi-millionaire because he was a descendant of someone else who was rich but he died homeless hungry frozen underneath a bridge and I believe the Lord showed me that he doesn't want his people to live like that. That if he is a God of abundance, if he is a God of greatness, of goodness, then we need to live according to that. If he says you are the light of the world, then that means that wherever we go, darkness should not be. 